So, uh, population and climate change. Population is a taboo subject. It, you are not supposed to talk about that. So, I'm going to try to break the taboo. Uh, I want to thank Safa Motesharre is an amazing student that I have from Iran. And Jorge Rivas happens to be my son. And uh, I want to thank uh, all these people that have contributed. So, uh, it, this, it, this is a, a, a very widely shown a, a picture that shows the development of climate models, past, present and future, and it was done by IPCC. And when Michael and I were working together at NASA, at that time the climate models just had the atmosphere. And then they, they put land surface and then they, they developed ocean models and, and coupled them and, and so on. And before we, we coupled the ocean to, with the atmosphere, before we got to here, we couldn't predict El Niño because we need to have full coupling between two systems in order to predict El Niño because El Niño is a, an instability that's the, of the coupled ocean atmosphere system. So without coupling, we, we just cannot represent it. And now, they are, everybody is very proud because we have all sorts of things, including all sorts of uh, chemistry and, and uh, aerosols and carbon cycle and so on. But we are still not coupling the most important component of the Earth system, which is the human system that dominates the whole system. And I think it's catastrophic if we don't realize that. So uh, this is a figure showing that climate is indeed happening, as, as you know. And this is a, another well-known figure that compares the, the evolution, predicted evolution of ice cover with the actual evolution. So it's happening in the Arctic. It's happening much faster than projected. So why, why do we have climate change? Since, 19, uh, since 1800, we are burning the fossil fuels that nature accumulated during millions of years. And by burning the accumulated carbon, we emit CO2 into the atmosphere. And the CO2 is like a blanket. Uh, so it produces greenhouse effect. So the atmosphere is warming up. And the total emission is, is population times emission per capita. And so, obviously, population is important, even, yeah. So this is the evolution of population. For almost ever and ever, the, pop the human population for hundreds of thousands of years was about two, three billion people in total. And then uh, around, uh, sorry, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 billion, 200,000 people, uh, uh, 200, yeah. So in, uh, it reached 1 billion in 1800, and then, it in especially in the second part of the last century, it, it grew more than exponentially. It's, uh, and why was the population able to grow so fast? There were two reasons. One is sanitation and antibiotics. So those made people live longer. But the, the most important and last, that's a transient effect, uh, but the most important thing is the use of fossil fuels in agriculture starting in the 1950s. So we are using fossil fuels in agriculture as fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation and mechanization. And, and this is really what's called the green revolution. And from 1950 to 1984, the production of grains increased by 250%. So this was very effective in, at that time, at least, to increase the, the, the production of grain. And the population, as a result, was able to double, and, and the famines were much reduced at that time. Yeah. So without, uh, <coughs> sorry. without fossil fuels, population would be much smaller. The, the growth in grain production is now flattening out. Industrial farming is destroying the forest and the soil. It's amazing we, we don't talk enough about the, the way soil is being destroy, destroyed. 
and urban and suburban sprawl is overrunning the best farmland. And this is not sustainable. So uh, Herman Daly, who is an ecological inventor, who is the creator of ecological economics, and, and is retired from the University of Maryland and also from the World Bank, where he left because he just hated the way they were doing things. So he said, we are drawing down the stock, we are using the stock of natural capital, natural capital, as if it was infinite, and it's not infinite. <coughs> and there is an example which is very, very striking. Uh, North Korea got cheap oil from the former Soviet Union until early 1990s. And uh, so, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> I ran out of battery apparently in my, yeah. So the, this shows the product, total production of grains in, in the former Soviet Union, which used uh, uh, f uh, fossil fuels that they got from the former Soviet Union very effectively. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, they had to buy it, and they were able to buy only half as much. And look at what happened with the production of grains. So I always thought that uh, the famines in Co North Korea were due to the horrible government that they have, and indeed they have a horrible government, but what really made the famines is, is the fact that it's, there was a sudden loss of access to abundant fuel. And a contrasting example is Cuba, who had exactly the same problem, but fortunately they are tropical for once, and for other, they have been investigating a lot about doing organic farming, and so they've switched to organic farming, and, and they are the only country that is, yeah, so, so, yes. I think uh, as a result of the famines in North Korea, there was a lot of research going into fertilizers, and, and it's got a pretty bad so, Sorry, you have to talk much louder <coughs> because I cannot hear. Okay. But uh, I, I looked at the latest data and the production is still that o over there, no? so it has not yet uh, reached, at least uh, that I can see. Sorry. Uh, so, population growth affects every environmental challenge we face. Generations, greenhouse gases, land, the, the additional uh, global warming due to land use change. We usually ignore this, but this is huge. Generation of other pollutants, resource depletion, water, oil, fisheries, topsoil, and resource wars and civil conflicts. Every war that we have is, is due to resource conflicts, and they are associated with population. Malnutrition and world hunger, lack of resources for education and health care, and, and the best farmland converted to urban and suburban sprawl, and garbage disposal and need to find more uh, land fill or, or, or ocean fill or, or air fill that to, to, to throw away our garbage and species extinctions and many other things. And people say, oh, come on, the, the population problem is already solved. The second derivative is, is, is becoming negative, but the, it's, it's not really true. The, the, the population growth is uh, continuing and uh, at this very, very high level, which is equivalent to adding one Germany every year, and it's higher than what it was during the explosion of, of, of the na na uh, second half. So the, the number of births per women here, there are two lines. Uh, this is uh, replacement level, and this is a typical, uh, so there are, there are many countries that have less than replacement and many countries that have more. And, uh, but the, the, we are still growing and, and some developed countries like the UK and the US are, are growing uh, very considerably. This is the estimation of the, <coughs> of the United Nations of what will happen in 2100 and many of, of the selected countries that were plotted here are uh, 
the, the New Zealand, uh, U USA, Norway, Canada. So it's, it's not just uh, poor countries. So is, is this population sustainable? We, we know that it takes as much energy to produce a gallon of ethanol from corn than what we get from burning it. The ratio is about this. But f we don't really know that we spend orders of magnitude more calories to grow food with fossil fuels than we get from it. And this is unsustainable because we are using non-renewable resources. This is very important, non-renewable resources. Again, Herman Daly says uh, uh, we are drawing down the stock of natural capital as, as if it was infinite. So the real world resources are, are finite, so this is unsustainable. And many researchers think that we are well beyond the Earth's current capacity, which is estimated at 1 to 2 billion, and every year we are s at 75 million more. Um, so, uh, it's interesting, this, this is the estimation of the, uh, of, of the United Nations that uh, of at, at 2100, uh, the orange one is the one that I showed before, and now they've updated it to from 9 billion to 10 billion. And there was a study by the London School of Economics that, that said that per dollar spent, Family planning reduces four times as uh, per dollar spent as carbon as, as adapting, adopting low carbon technologies. <coughs> what about human rights? Sorry, I'm going to talk during the first half about these uh, uh, conceptual things, and then I'm going to talk about models, so uh, don't worry, the math is coming, although it will be simple. <laughs> so, uh, Many, when people think of reducing population growth, they think only of coercive measures, like the one child target in China, forced sterilizations in India. And this misses the fact that most women are forced to have more children than they want. It's a human rights issue indeed, but in the opposite direction, not, not in the what we conventional accepted direction. It's so, an issue in both directions. Yeah, yeah. But uh, all my Chinese women students agree completely they, they, with, with uh, uh, one child per family. So they, they don't feel it was. Uh, international UN polls show that in many countries, more than 80% of married women of reproductive age with two children do not want to have more children. And my son had a girlfriend who is a nurse in, in Minneapolis, and she was asked by a Somali pa patient why she had no children. She responded that she had not wanted any yet. The response of the Somali woman was, wow, you are so lucky to have that choice. I have six children already, and I have no choice in the matter. I wish I had that choice. So that, that's a very important human rights issue. Non-coercive methods to reduce growth exist. The UN ne estimates that 40% of all pregnancies are unintended. So if we ha had uh, birth control available, that would solve very much the problem. Just helping women to avoid unintended pregnancies would have a huge impact. Non-coercive ways to drastically reduce fertility are is, uh, education. That, that's education of women especially, but education in general, access to birth control, like Mexico has done, and e equal economic opportunity for, for women. And if every woman of bearing age had only one child, the, the population would be reduced to, a, to a, a, a current capacity sustainable in about 150 years. Supportive government policies are needed to, to empower women and the good news, there are many countries that are reducing the population uh, even lower than China's 1.7 without coercive measures. And, and the, uh, what about the economics of reducing population? We constantly, the, the, the press, at least in the United States, says, wow, we, uh, if we reduce the population, we are going to have a horrible de demographic crisis that there will be not enough children to 
support the older people. So le let's look at the evidence. Uh, China has had the strictest population control policy since the 70s. The birth per woman uh, went from over 6 to 1.7, and it's estimated that more than the population of the US births have been avoided. At the same time, China has had and continues to have the highest rate ever of sustained economic growth in human history. Similarly, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan have had extremely high sustained economic growth with very low birth rates and the Philippines, which has a higher population growth, has had lower economic growth. So, there is so and the other thing that, that well, the, again, the same thing about the, uh, having a demographic crisis if, if we have lower birth rates due to the shortage of workers. So we are repeatedly, we hear this all the time. And uh, today, virtually all economies suffer from very large labor surpluses and high unemployment rates. Even in Japan, with a country with the highest ratio of retirees to workers has high, relatively high unemployment, not as, as bad as as the US is right now. So this demographic horror story would uh, uh, in, increase the, the employment, obviously. So uh, Dean Baker of the Center of Economic and Policy Research explains fewer workers would mean unemployment levels would fall, workers' wages will rise and higher wages shift the labor from low productivity to high productivity work. So we may have fewer greeters at Walmart and valet parking or all night convenience stores and dangerous uh, or unpopular work will be me mechanized and the workers' race will rise. And he asks, has this crisis scared you that the wages will rise and there will be less unemployment and better jobs? So uh, this is going, I'm going to go very quickly over some uh, the, of the basic ideas of ecological economics. Uh, the, the standard economic model for which, sa, uh, sa, sorry, there was a Nobel Prize for somebody, uh, has firms, goods and services, households, labor and capital. So this allows growing and growing and growing with, without any limit input are uh, resources and uh, uh, the standard economic model uh, that that we have in the neo uh, uh, sorry the, in the current uh, uh, economic uh, economics that dominates especially the United States does not ac account for inputs uh, which are resources outputs which are pollution stocks of natural capital dissipation of energy it's like a perpetual motion machine depletion, destruction of, or transformation of matter. So there are no effects on the, on the Earth system. And Herman Daly introduced, uh, for that reason, ecological economic, in, including the Earth system. So he basically said, we have an Earth system and the human ecology is within that system. And it, it requires inputs, which are like energy and matter, and outputs, which are emissions, waste products, and surface changes. And so ecological economics should account for these inputs and outputs into the Earth system. And the, the inputs come from sources in the Earth system, and the outputs go to sinks in the Earth system. Like, and the sinks, you can guess it, are ocean, atmosphere, and land. So that's where we put our garbage. For, uh, for much of history, uh, 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 we lived in an empty world. So the, the human economy was very tiny compared to the, the, the air system. So it had a small impact on sources and sinks. So in, 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 in this scenario, the standard isolated economic model might make some sense. But not only has the population increased by a factor of 20, essentially, but also the, the productivity per capita, the economic output per, per person, has also increased even more. And the total impact is the product of this times this. So uh, the and people say, oh, technology will save us. 
so technology allows more efficient production, but also uh, uh, forces or greater consumption. So what we have now is, is the opposite. It's, it's a human economy that completely covers the, the Earth system. Uh, it has very large effects on the Earth system. It depletes the sources and it's filling the sinks. And depletion and pollution cannot con continue forever. So this uh, I'm going to skip, but it in, if you do climate modeling, you should include all these uh, two-way interactions between between the human and, and the system. So uh, with uh, with uh, Safa Motesare and Jorge Rivas, we uh, we basically decided sorry that what we need is a. a a completely coupled Earth system and the human system. And this is a schematic of our what we want to have. We want to have population and demographics as part of the human system and account for all these things like energy, industrial, and, and interact both ways with, with the, the Earth system. And and very importantly, include uh, different regions and different regions that have different policies. So uh, the policies determine uh, 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 how we go. It, and this means government policies. Uh, we, we have only developed a, a, a simple subsystem for the water. So it has a air system which has an atmosphere and uh, land and, and river inflow and, and outflow. And, and then this is the water system. And we include the population as part of, of the system. And this uh, really has, had, uh, has allowed us to, to make, uh, so to speak, thought experiments about what happens when, for example, the population grows and the needs for water increases and, and, and uh, if you fix the leaks or, or use technology to improve or, or uh, how much the recycling of waste water uh, in has. And what happens if, for example, you are in a, an area with like Somalia where the permanent war has destroyed the reservoirs of, of, of fresh water. So I mentioned government policies. Can they be effective? Uh, I, I was really struck when I saw this figure that shows uh, between 1960 and, and uh, 2008, uh, 2008 the, the, <coughs> the number of births per women. And Argentina, where I was born, I, my family had, my parents had eight children. And, and I was number seven, so it's not that I don't. But at that time in Argentina, the average uh, number of births per woman was, was about three. And Argentina has never had any policy about birth control because they feel like there is plenty of room. So basically, it has uh, reduced just a little bit to, to 2.5 or something like that. And, and here is uh, uh, Brazil, wh which had more than six, and now Brazil is the same as China, 1.7 per, per and, and here is Mexico, which had almost seven per woman, and, and now it has the same as the US, 2.1. So why did that, this happen? Uh, actually, the governments in Brazil and Mexico instituted family planning to, to policies to lower population growth and and this shows that it matters and I asked my 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 Mexican colleagues and, uh, and my uh, and his, uh, one of them explained in detail he <laughs> before he got married he had to go through through <laughs> birth control learning but the most important thing is that they plaster they said the country with with uh, with uh, 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 signs that say fewer fewer children lead to better life and have uh, 
fam families with fewer children live better and, and, and let's have fewer children so that we, have, we can give them what they need. And, but the most important thing is that they made, at least in the 1970s, uh, available for free birth control. And Brazil, apparently the most powerful uh, 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 tool that they have to do this is a soap opera which shows that women that have a few children and work are, are very cool. And so that has had a lot of, of influence. And this is another example of, of uh, uh, government policies. If you look at, at the uh, NDVI, which is a Vegetation Productivity Index, you see, I, when I saw this the first time, I, I just couldn't believe it. Look at this. This is Argentina, uh, Paraguay, Brazil, and Uruguay. And, and, and this is uh, the one province in Argentina called Misiones. And, and look, it has much more productivity it, than it so goes out of scale uh, than all the nearby regions. So, and I thought that it was an Argentinian government policy, but not. It's, it's the sm small, this small province has a, a policy that protects the forest and it does it in a very limited way because uh, 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 forest production is domi dominates the, their income and, and they, they protect 30% and the other can be exploited but only in a sustainable way and look how satellite can detect that, that, that uh, incredible policy and I'll mention that in Japan during the 1700 uh, and 1800s the shoguns realized that they were running out of, every, we are, they were cutting the trees and they were going to run out of trees. So beginning around 1666, the Shogun government uh, 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 developed an advanced forest management policy and basically said only the Shogun can order a cutting of a tree and, and they developed scientific knowledge about uh, growing forest and plantation. And with these policies, uh, Japan averted a deforestation collapse, so it can be done. Another very interesting example is, is Kerala, which is a province in India. It's a very low wealth state, uh, and it has very high social development and welfare. And the Human Development Index, which measures the well-being of people, is the highest in India. The life expectancy is 75 compared to 64 and 77 in the US. The literacy rate is 91% compared to 65% in India. And they just have a, 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 a GDP, a, 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 sorry, I, I forget what it, but it's, it's, it's the money that's counted. Gross, gross domestic per production per capita of $300, that's, that's nothing. Much lower than in Mexico, for example. And, and they have 1.7 children, and, and basically what they did is build a, a statewide infrastructure for, for both health and, and education. And everybody goes to school, and even high school. And so and they have had many different governments, communist and not communist, and communist and not communist, but they all maintain these, these policies. So now comes uh, the equations, and I'm going to mention a, 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 a very s simple, minimal model that we developed, human and nature dynamical model, which we call HANDI. And it's very much similar to to the predator and prey model, but uh, where the predator is the population, which it's the prey, which is nature. So it's basically uh, nature is the prey and the population is the predator. But what we did different is that we separated the population into rich and poor. So it's a, it's a very minimal model and it's for thought experiments. So the total population is, is X, which is the rich and the poor. And 
now we have equal <coughs> equations for each of these. Uh, and so uh, y is nature, and nature is the na equation for nature is regeneration because we started with just a regenerative uh, nature like like woods or fisheries that regenerate and you use a logistic equation and then we uh, deplete or uh, with the production of, of uh, uh, things from nature which is uh, has a depletion coefficient delta and only the XP which means only the poor work in in producing which is similar to what happens in real life uh, and what it's proportional to nature so the wealth belongs to the rich that that manage it and and they earn pay themselves a, a, an inequality factor and in uh, uh, times more so they pay themselves a hundred times more and many experiments we did with this but we also change it why is nature it's resources. resource natural resources that that for example like fisheries or or wood Yeah, this is not what they. This is not how they use it, but how they extract it. The miners are. The, uh, this represents the miners or the farm workers or the people that actually produce from nature. No, not the use. The use will come here. Uh, so they they pay themselves. So they use nature at a hundred times more rate. So the, these are the workers. And the workers that produce are, are the poor, and then they, the rich pay themselves for managing a hundred times more. So the, the, we have to account for the accumulated wealth. wealth. So the wealth increases we through the production term, which is this, and decreases by the consumption by the poor and the consumption by the rich. So the production is this term here, delta x, uh, x poor y minus a, a subsistence salary that are paid to the poor minus k kappa times the subsistence salary that are paid to the rich by themselves. Population equations uh, uh, also require death and, and, and birth and, sorry, Sorry. So the, the most important thing is that the death rate depends on whether there is enough food to eat. So uh, this represents the equations for, for the growth or death of the population poor and the rich population and this is the death rate and this this is the birth rate and the death rate uh, is is uh, at a healthy value as long as there is enough wealth this represents the wealth over the minimum wealth that we have to have and as long as as there is enough wealth the the population uh, uh, death rate is is uh, at a healthy level, like like 70 years or something like that. Uh, sorry, <laughs> we are. I am over 70. And, yeah, he's pushing. pushing. Yeah. And but when when the wealth decreases, then the poor uh, 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 the the poor start dying much faster until they reach a famine level of 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 death. But the rich have accumulated all this wealth so they can spend it on themselves and, and they take much longer before they start actually dying themselves. So let's look at the, re at the results. So this is a, a typical uh, experiment and... Uh, sorry, uh, can you just go back to the equations? I mean, you did mention predator prey and sort of Lotka-Volterra type. 
where is, I mean, uh, the, the XP and XR equations are independent of each other. They only depend on the way that you parameterize alpha and beta. Uh, where is the, uh, you know, positive negative feedback uh, yeah. in this business? There, the, this is the accumulated wealth. And the wealth when the wealth uh, becomes uh, uh, depleted, then, then the death rate changes. It's not between poor and rich, it's between production and population. Between nature, between and, nature and, and population. Okay, so yeah, now I see it. So it's a W equation that has the minus... Uh, yeah, XP minus... And XR. Yeah, okay. it's, this is a sustainable... I yeah, mean, the no, subsystem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this is a, a typical result, and, and the numbers are just scalable, so it, 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 they don't really mean uh, anything. The, po the population, the, the nature is in green, and, and also these years were put by just, they don't, they are not meaningful, but uh, the population is at, uh, uh, starts with the maximum possible population. I mean, the, the nature, nature starts at, at its maximum, and then uh, population starts at a very small number, and we call commoners the poor and elites the rich because people thought that using rich and poor was too gross. So commoners means poor and elites means uh, rich. And what we plot is not the, the, the number of, of rich people, but the number of rich people multiplied by kappa, that coefficient which is 100, which is what they deplete. So uh, the, the real population is a hundred, uh, of rich is much smaller, but they deplete much more. So the, the population uh, grows by, by, by birth rates being larger than the, than the death rates. And this is a carrying capacity that would give you a stationary uh, a solution. And the wealth increases and actually when the population crosses the, the, the current capacity, the wealth it has a maximum. So a crisis, an economic crisis is an indication of, of, of <laughs> for this model of, uh, that the current capacity has been exceeded. And, and then the population keeps growing and, and the wealth, uh, and so the, there is more consumed of the wealth than, than produced. And eventually the, the the, they get into to, uh, uh, essentially a famine and, and, and they die. And in the meantime, the, the, the rich grow and they, they at, at the, uh, uh, like a, 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 a 70 or 100 years before the commoners start dying, the, the rich are still growing because they have accumulated wealth. So, uh, nature declines with the population growth and using the wealth the rich elites can shield themselves from environmental degradation which first affects the commoners eventually it reaches the upper classes as well when it's too late to take preventive measures in this simple model by 2020 but that was a, that that's really not meaningful the population sur surpasses the car, car the sustainable current capacity and it's drawing down the accumulated capital to survive. This thought experiment shows how a crisis can happen rapidly, even though it appears that population is rising steadily without any problems, and that the wealthy should, would not feel the effects of the collapse until it's too late for the poor, and then it's too late for the rich as well. So, uh, can we survive? Yes, indeed. Uh, actually, uh, if we we can survive if we choose the parameters so that the, we reduce substantially the economic stratification. So instead of, uh, we, for this model, instead of kappa equal to 100, which is probably 500 for, for, the, for the top 0.01%, uh, if we reduce, reduce this to less than 10, 
and we reduce the depletion per capita and also reduce the population growth. And then we can have a, a much larger population than before, but, but uh, at a steady state. And, and nature is at, uh, le at half the maximum level, which ma uh, has the maximum productivity. So the current capacity is the population that nature can sustain forever. If we use nature in a sustainable way, and only consume as much as nature can regrow, we can reach a good state of equilibrium. And then we developed a, a new version of, of this model with three types of natural resources. So in, in Handy One, we had only regenerating nature, like forest, soil, herds, fisheries, game. But we added non-renewable stocks, and now we are adding also flows of renewable uh, uh, energy, like solar, winds, river, geothermal. So, the, this is, uh, we added a non-renewable source to Handy, and this is the original Handy, and the original Handy has this nature that, uh, 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 and it's, oh, it's shown over, over 900 years and the elites and the commoners and the wealth and here's where we cross the current capacity. And then we added non-renewables and what happened with that? The, for the same 900 years we find that uh, we use the, not just the renewables that we had before but also the non-renewables and, and the, the, the wealth uh, increases much more the, the population, we'll see what, what happens. So this is a comparison of adding non-renewables and it's, it's just amazing because uh, adding non-renewable with a, a total capacity similar to one, what w one would assume we, we have uh, uh, postponed the collapse by 200 years. So the, the, the collapse that uh, is postponed here by, by about 200 years and the, it increases the maximum population by a factor of 20 and that's very much similar to what we are doing now. Uh, we, we went from about 0.2 or 0.3 billion to 7 billion which is about 20 or, or more. So, uh, do I have uh, five more minutes? Yes. yes uh, analogy between atomic distribution and the distribution of income. And this is another model that was developed by uh, Yakovenko et al., no, not by us. He, uh, he said atoms in a gas are identical, but the probability distribution of their energies is highly unequal, with few atoms having very high energies and many atoms having low energies. So in statistical physics, P of E is given by the exponential Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution following from maximization of entropy in the ensemble of interacting atoms. So Yakovenko said, how about uh, applying this to, to this similar probabilistic approach to ensembles of interacting uh, uh, people, economic agents, with, and, and he used for verification the internal revenue service that collects taxes. And when I saw this, I thought he must have cheated because the, the, the curves are, are the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution this up, up to here. And here, uh, over here, there is a different distribution that supports that. So he applied a similar probability approach to ensembles of economic agents and obtained probability distribution that are in remarkable agreement with empirical data. The, the, the dots are from the IRS, the taxes. It's, it's unbelievable. But this shows very, very clearly that although we may think this is a natural distribution with rich and poor, there is on the very top a very completely different uh, uh, distribution. That means the rich are much richer than they should be with a natural distribution. So this, uh, in his data, this starts with the top 3%. So he compared uh, uh, between 1983 and 2008 of uh, internal revenue service data and 
he shows that the inequality increased and all the growth went to the top 3%. But, but it's interesting that this is obtained with, the, with uh, use <laughs> assuming that the natural distribution could be uh, 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 the Boltzmann distribution. So uh, this shows the, the Gini coefficient of inequality, which is increasing unbelievably, which means uh, in the US all, the, the gross national product has increased, gross domestic product has increased enormously since the 1970s to the present, and it went all to the 1% and, and the, the top, bottom, 99% actually have decreased their, their, their uh, earnings. And this is the exponential of the Pareto distribution that he finds fits the, the richest. And the fact that, it's in, uh, uh, that it has this slope means that the richer are, 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 are becoming much, much, much richer than, than their corresponding. And, and this is the uh, percentage of of the total income in the rich tail, and, and it was about uh, 4% in, the, in, in 1980, and, and uh, it's about 40% now. So, I, I, I'll finish with this. We are using, yes, with a summary, we are using in, in 200 plus years the fossil fuels that nature accumulated over millions and millions of years. That should be a, a big a big alarm bell. Climate change is due to total emissions, <coughs> emissions per capita times number of people, so we should consider that. The use of fossil fuels for agriculture in increased food production enormously, and it also increased the population enormously after 1950. And handy uh, thought experiments showed that reducing social inequality, population growth, and depletion per capita allows a uh, society to become sustainable. But if we don't do that, our little thought model suggests that, that uh, <laughs> it collapses coming. So when we add non-renewables, uh, uh, the, the, it postpones the collapse by 200 years and it increase, increases the maximum population by 200 years, but the, pol the collapse happens. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>